So I'm teaching a full semester acting class this fall. I'm absolutely loving it. And uh, last week, I get an email from the university mentioning that my class happened to fall on mental health awareness and screening week. And would I mind passing along a brief video to my students? And of course, I, I was happy to do it, but it got me thinking about this moment here, where I'd get a chance to talk to you. I mean, I knew Noah was headed to QED, which meant another chance for one of these Alaya tribes. And so I got to thinking about what I wanted you to know about mental illness, what I wanted to tell you. See, we live in a very different world than when I was first diagnosed with depression. The only depressed people I knew about or heard about outside of my own family were poets and writers who had killed themselves. Sylvia Plath, Ernest Hemingway, Virginia Woolf, I never heard of anyone living with depression, only dying of it. And even the experience of those poets didn't match up with my own. Their depression seemed so well-expressed, so delicate, so grand. Their depression seemed like one last poem they had lent to the world, and mine, mine was just pathetic. Now, look, obviously, everyone's depression is different, but to express to you what mine is like, or at least what it's like when it's bad, I need you to imagine the worst thing you've ever done. A time when you got caught or maybe even just accused of something terrible and it felt like the whole world was against you. Maybe a time when people in your life said and did unforgivably cruel things to you that made you feel entirely alone in a pain that's so total, it's damn near physical. And look, I, I hope you can't relate to that feeling, but most of us can. And that's what depression is like all the time. You wake up with that lump in your stomach, that feeling that you've done something wrong, that something terrible has happened, but the terrible thing is just, it's just you. And that's before the self-talk starts. And it never really seems to stop. Not a voice in your head so much as it is just a rising certainty that everything you do and say is stupid and shameful and just very obviously the worst I remember during a very especially bad bout of depression as a kid sitting and eating a peanut butter and banana sandwich and crystal clear, like it had been whispered in my ear, I had the thought, that's right, you just eat your stupid fucking sandwich. Which, can I say, in retrospect, is a pretty funny depression thought, but hilarious in retrospect or not, nobody else had depression like me. Right? My depression was not, as Susan Sontag put it, melancholy without its charms. It was messy and ugly and mean. All day, every day, mean. Mean in a way that I believed and identified with, in a way that I don't know that I'll ever be free of. And add to that that I have what was known at the time as refractory depression and is now called treatment-resistant depression. Can I say I'm kind of glad they hadn't started using that term when I was diagnosed, but the, the point is the medications and the treatments available at the time of my diagnosis didn't work for me. Right? Finding medication that helped me was a years-long process, and the slips and slides along the way were painful and embarrassing. It felt like I couldn't even heal in the way medicine intended, that I was somehow so irrevocably broken that even medical science had no help for me. And in the middle of all of this, in a therapy session, a very good psychologist told me something that absolutely baffled me. He said, one of these days, the idea of suicide will be completely reprehensible to you. One of these days, you'll put the chance of killing yourself at 0%. And I was like, Zero percent? I mean, I, I laughed at him. Like, when you're in the throes of depression, you feel like you're underwater, and suicide sounds like coming up for air. I mean, I'd been joking, thinking, or outright planning to kill myself since I was a child. 
I'm not exaggerating. I found one of my old journals this year, and the earliest entry I could find where I expressed the desire to kill myself was when I was seven years old. And when I told him that, this doctor looked at me, and and he shared the only thing about himself that he would ever share with me. He said, I get it. I was there, and now I'm here. And now, here I am, almost 20 years after talking to that doctor, and and he was right. I'm at a zero. Now, look, a, a lot of that is my kid, right? I think before I had my kid, I had gotten my offing myself percentages down pretty low, but now that it's something I would do to my son, yeah, it's it's zero. There's no set of circumstances, no feeling of waking up that sends me that direction. I don't think about suicide seriously, and I don't think about trying to fly seriously. That's how certain I am. And look, it took a lot of work, messy work, therapists and pills and mental health walks and meditations, all the shit you see on brightly colored posters. But it also took setbacks and failures and patient friends and family and also not patient friends, people I lost, people who didn't want to stick around till I was better. That is their choice. And I still don't know that I can bring myself to blame them for it. In fact, I wouldn't hear anyone talk about depression in the way that I felt it until well into adulthood on John Green's podcast, The Anthropocene Reviewed, in an essay called Harvey. I send people that audio and that text quite a bit. You should check it out if you haven't. The image John Green conjures of lying on his kitchen floor, unable to do anything but stare at the world through the bubbles in a liter of 7-Up. That was a depression I could identify with. That was a depression like mine. But more importantly, someone who I admired had been through it. And so, like Harvey helped me, I hope this gives you some hope, wherever you are. Maybe your depression isn't as bad as mine. Maybe it's worse. But maybe you've never heard someone describe looking up from the bottom the way you see it and maybe hearing that there is in fact a way up from that bottom helps you. Maybe it sounds as absurd to you as the doctor sounded to me, but here I am and there I was. It's so hard not to sound stereotypical when you talk about this stuff. It's so easy to feel inauthentic and trite because Beautiful language, by the very nature of beauty, lies about the experience. Poetic flourish betrays the prosaic reality. So, I guess what I wanted to tell you is just what that doctor told me. That it's possible. I was there. And now I'm here. <laughs> 